Well, good afternoon and welcome to CSIS for this uh, uh, event. Uh, this is a joint event of the Missile Defense Project and the Project on Military and Diplomatic History. I'm Mark Kansi and I'm the Interim Director for the uh, Project on Military and Diplomatic History. Many of you will notice that I am not Mark Moyer. Uh, who has been the director up, and, up until now. He has gone into government and I've uh, taken over the reins for a couple of months until we get a permanent uh, director. I welcome you all here. The project is, uh, uh, brings distinguished historians to Washington to talk about their craft and what they've been working on. Our hope is to get uh, more interest in military and diplomatic history, which is a very important uh, part of history, but hasn't got the kind of visibility that we believe it really uh, deserves in the last uh, really couple of decades. Uh, before we move to the panel, I have to make one administrative announcement, and that is that in the unlikely case of an emergency, uh, Tom or I will give instructions about what to do. We'll evacuate either the front or the back, but it's never happened, so I don't expect that we'll have to do it this afternoon. So with that, I'd like to turn things over to Tom Caracco, who uh, will say a word about the Missile Defense Project, introduce our panel, and uh, moderate. Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, so I'm Tom Caracco. Uh, I run the Missile Defense work here at CSIS. Uh, and as Mark uh, said, this is a joint effort. Uh, the previous director, Mark Moyer, uh, who's uh, gone on to other uh, opportunities, uh, reached out and said, you know, there's this new book by uh, this, this gentleman, James Cameron, uh, would you be interested in putting together a, a panel on it? And I said, sure. Um, and the reason is, you know, the, the project, which what we try to do is broaden and deepen what is uh, all too uh, frequently a shallow discussion about missile defense. And so, uh, you know, coming to this sort of panel and having a discussion about the history and the strategic logic uh, back to the 1960s and 1970s is, is an opportunity to, to kind of uh, uh, further that, uh, that enterprise. Uh, so we're excited to host uh, uh, Dr. James Cameron, uh, whose book is called The Double Game, The Demise of America's First Missile Defense System and the Rise of Strategic Arms Limitation, which I think was 2017, uh, just published. Uh, he is currently an assistant professor in international relations at the uh, Fundaco Gutalio Vargas. Apologies if I uh, butcher that in Sao Paulo, Brazil. So thank you for flying up. Uh, and he's previously worked at the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford University uh, and at the Brady Johnson Program in Grand Strategy at Yale University. Uh, our next speaker is going to be Ambassador Robert Joseph, a senior scholar at the National Institute for Public Policy. Uh, he's had a distinguished career in government service, uh, including, and I'm not gonna list everything, uh, including as Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security, as Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Proliferation Strategy, Counterproliferation and Homeland Defense on the National Security Council, uh, and a number of other positions. Uh, he's also a Senior Advisor uh, here at CSIS and a member of our uh, Advisory Board for the Missile Defense Project. And finally, uh, Biliana Lilly is an Assistant Policy Researcher at RAND in Southern California. She's completing her PhD at Pardee Rand Graduate School. She did it backwards, however. She wrote the book before the PhD, uh, and I came to know of her uh, as the author of the book, Russian Foreign Policy Towards Missile Defense, Actors, Motivations, and Influence, which I think was 2014 uh, or thereabout. Uh, she's previously worked as an associate at Brookings Institution uh, and at the Eurasia, Eurasia Foundation uh, here in Washington. So we're gonna let each of them uh, speak for a little bit. Uh, and James, why don't you give us a, a summary of what the book's about, and then we'll open it up. Lovely. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Tom. Um, that was a wonderful in introduction. I should just say uh, thank you. Uh, I suppose I should say to the two Marks um, for, for putting this uh, event together as well, and Mark Moyer in particular. Um, and it's a great pleasure to be on the panel uh, with uh, Ambassador Joseph and Biliana Lilly. Um, so I'm going to do a couple of things. I'm going to talk a little bit about the rationale, the strategic uh, climate at the time in the late 1960s and early 1970s that led to the conclusion of the ABM Treaty. And then I'm going to talk about the domestic politics, which in the book, uh, The Double Game, is a very important part uh, of the story. And then I'll conclude uh, with a few reflections on, on the differences, primarily, uh, between that time and today's uh, dilemmas. So. Uh, the ABM Treaty uh, was signed in Moscow in, on May 26, 1972, uh, between uh, the United States and the Soviet Union, uh, President Richard Nixon and Leonid Brezhnev. Um, and these, and th this agreement basically limited um, 
the United States and the USSR uh, to two uh, missile defense sites each, ground-based missile defense sites each, with 100 interceptors. And the important thing about that uh, was that they were far enough away, and in particular the radars were further enough away from each other to eliminate the possibility of building a national missile defense system. So, in effect, uh, the treaty uh, outlawed uh, a national missile defense system for both uh, superpowers. Um, that treaty was signed at the same time as an interim agreement that froze um, offensive forces. And both, and they sort of work together. And the basic rationale, or at least as it was understood at the time, uh, was um, the rationale of which, uh, which became notorious, of course, which was mutual assured destruction or MAD. Um, and mutual assured destruction was based, predicated on the idea um, that basically the US and the USSR had built um, uh, strategic forces that were capable of absorbing um, a first strike and responding um, with a devastating counterblow even after um, absorbing uh, that attack. Um, in the late 1960s, I should say as well, both sides through their own um, particular processes had come to the conclusion um, that uh, missile defense, at least on the national scale, uh, was not feasible. Um, because of the state of the technology at the time, radar computing, um, the interceptor technology uh, also. Um, and so the idea, at least as it was portrayed, was that to cap offensive forces uh, to ensure that nobody could gain a decisive uh, superiority and ban missile defenses to leave um, the two sides open uh, to, um, to a retaliatory blow. So you couldn't strike first and hope uh, that your uh, forces, uh, you would be able to ride out um, a second strike uh, through your missile defense system. Um, now that's the story, and it was quite a clean one. Um, the problem is that now we have access to a vast archival record uh, on, um, on uh, Nixon's thinking in particular, and this goes all, we have uh, Kennedy's thinking and Johnson's thinking, but Nixon, um, what comes clear, th very clear um, through the documents and the transcripts is that he did not believe in MAD. Um, and the man signed these two treaties um, that um, basically enshrined MAD or um, seemingly did, um, and he did not believe uh, in MAD. So we have to uh, explain that. So the strategic story is one story, um, but Nixon was playing a double game, as I call it. He thought, uh, had very different ideas uh, in, in public. Uh, he expressed himself in a very different way in public than he did uh, in private. Um, and the key thing to understand about Nixon's logic in this, in this instance um, is that he was um, in a very, very new uh, situation uh, domestically. And the domestic situation was an unprecedented collapse uh, in the consensus regarding militarized containment of the Soviet Union, which really had been the consensus position since the 1940s, the late 1940s. Um, and Nixon really had to struggle with that. Um, and it came home to him actually in the first year of his presidency uh, when he proposed uh, an ABM system for the US and that only passed the Senate uh, by one vote. So it was a very, very uh, close run thing. And so faced with this backlash against uh, containment, uh, Nixon had to uh, make a virtue uh, out of necessity, if you like, and try to uh, grab what he called the peace issue. And the peace issue was to try um, to uh, come up with a strategy which would satiate what he saw as this new back backlash against uh, containment, uh, which was uh, coming out uh, of the Vietnam War and the disquiet in American society, at uh, least from some quarters, about the course uh, of the Vietnam War. And so, um, ideally, Nixon would have wanted a, a, an agreement on Vietnam, uh, but by late 70, it seems like he's not going to get one, and he reaches out and tries to make a deal with the Soviets on arms control as a kind of substitute, a domestic political substitute uh, for uh, the, uh, an agreement on Vietnam uh, to take into the 1972 presidential election. He wants something uh, to take into that uh, election. Um, and so what he does, essentially, him and uh, Henry Kissinger essentially concede uh, on the key uh, parts uh, of the Soviet desire um, for uh, an agreement. They agree to limit, for, on a permanent basis, um, missile defense, 
which is the part that the Soviets are most worried about because they worry that the Americans are technologically superior to them. Um, and they agree on an interim agreement on offensive forces, which is really um, the American concern. And it's a temporary agreement, it's not a comprehensive agreement, um, and it leaves uh, the, uh, the United States actually at a disadvantage in terms of uh, the number of missiles, the number of offensive missiles. Um, so Nixon um, goes to Congress and makes uh, the case for the ABM Treaty and the interim, interim Agreement essentially on the basis of MAD, or at least he doesn't use that phrase, of course, um, but he talks about the positive aspects of stability, while at the same time having deep, deep doubts, um, even up until the summit, about the wisdom um, of what he is doing. So that's the book. Um, it's about this double game uh, between the public uh, and the private and the key role uh, of domestic politics. So what does this tell us um, today? Um, so there are a number of key differences, and I think um, the key, the differences are more uh, striking than the similarities. Um, and this is, you may think, well, this isn't particularly useful. It actually shows the depth of, of the challenge which faces us. Um, in the 70s, the United States insisted on the linkage between offensive and defensive arms, right? So the two uh, processes would go forward together, um, and that was a key uh, American demand. Um, obviously, since the early 2000s, that's not the case. Um, the situation is somewhat uh, reversed, and the Americans now um, are, are much, much more um, interested in proceeding only with an offensive agreement and have left um, uh, the defensive part um, um, out of uh, negotiations. And so this is a key uh, difference. And the Russians, of course, um, have predicated any kind of future uh, negotiations on a follow-on treaty uh, to the linkage, the relinkage of um, offensive and defensive forces, which is a big change. Um, of course, that means that small powers in the United States strategy rank far higher than they did in the Cold War. This is no longer a bipolar uh, confrontation. And given the depth of the differences between the two sides, um, we will be lucky, I think, to, um, to have to, uh, for the agreements that we have on INF and New START, um, if they uh, would be lucky if they endure um, much longer. The other big thing, of course, is on the domestic political side. And one of the important things to note about Nixon was that he was a hardliner. Um, and the, one of the ways in which he brought along the conservatives um, domestically was saying, look, you know, you know me, I'm um, hardcore anti-communist, and therefore um, you don't have to worry. Um, Trump, um, obviously, in this very different, different situation with his own domestic political difficulties regarding Russia, um, and so he doesn't have that. Um, he's also quite uh, anti-arms um, control uh, in general. Um, the other thing which is very different is the divisiveness of the debate. And what's interesting about the 60s is this is a real outlier in American uh, post-war history, um, which is that there's this huge divisiveness over the wisdom of military spending and far, far more divisive domestic political environment on that issue than we have uh, today. And that was a, that, that's a huge um, difference. So given the huge differences, I think we really have to start again um, and think uh, in new terms about the future of arms control uh, going forward. So with that, I will conclude. Thank Great. you. Ambassador Joseph. Tom, thank you very much for including me. Uh, James, congratulations on, on your book. I look forward to reading it and learning from it. And Liliana, it's uh, nice that uh, I can have a chance to, to meet and learn from you as well. I understand your work at RAND is very impressive. Uh, my uh, task uh, in this panel, a rather youthful panel, as I look around, I feel not only that I'm going to learn a great deal this afternoon, but I'm already feeling 10 years younger. Uh, or maybe that's 20 or 30 years younger. Uh, but my task is to talk about the, uh, the end of the ABM Treaty. Uh, and I had the uh, opportunity, the, really the privilege, uh, to work for uh, three presidents uh, on ABM Treaty issues. Uh, first, uh, President Reagan, uh, when I was uh, much younger, uh, and then pr uh, Bush 41 and Bush 43. Both Presidents Reagan and Bush 41 uh, talked about the need to withdraw from the ABM Treaty, but never did. Uh, Bush 43, as you all know, uh, left the treaty. Uh, we uh, announced our uh, withdrawal in December of 2001, and that took effect in June of 2002. Let me just say a few words uh, about Reagan and, and Bush 41. Uh, 
During the Reagan uh, era, as I mentioned, I was uh, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense uh, for uh, nuclear forces and arms control, which included missile defense. And I had the responsibility uh, of uh, advancing uh, within DOD and representing within the interagency DOD's position on the President's strategic defense initiative, the initiative that he announced in March of uh, 1983. And in his speech uh, at that time, Reagan questioned uh, the underlying strategic rationale uh, of the ABM Treaty, uh, as well as the moral underpinnings uh, of the treaty. Uh, he rejected the notion uh, that our security, that our very survival, uh, relied on the concept of mutual assured destruction or MAD. And in a radical, a radical departure from conventional thinking on deterrence at the time, at least the thinking that was embodied and codified in the ABM Treaty, he envisioned effective defenses against missile attack as stabilizing, as actually contributing to deterrence. And he approved as the phase one requirement for SDI the capacity to intercept a specific percentage of Soviet warheads. And this was intended to reduce the confidence of Soviet war planners in their ability to achieve their war objectives. Uh, and with reduced confidence, the uh, uncertainty uh, would contribute to sort of uh, strengthening deterrence. Uh, on the R&D side, uh, SDI was uh, first and foremost uh, a research uh, effort. Uh, the Reagan administration uh, pushed the limits on what could be done, uh, employing uh, what was uh, described as the broad interpretation of the treaty, which permitted us to do a number of things uh, in the research area. Uh, but it also had uh, the unintended effect, I believe, at the time of keeping us within the treaty. By allowing us to do more in the treaty, it actually kept us in the treaty. Uh, in Bush 41, I served as the U.S. Commissioner to the Standing Consultative Commission. Uh, during the first part uh, of my tenure in the commission, I sat across the table from stone-faced Soviet diplomats uh, who rejected any concept or any uh, allegation uh, that the Soviet Union was violating the ABM Treaty through the, with the construction of the Krasnyarsk radar. Uh, the second half of the time I was commissioner, I sat across the table from the Russian delegation happened to be the same people, but they were no longer stone-faced, they were actually just confused. And they were confused for the most part because of the statements of their leaders, uh, including, uh, and first and foremost, President Yeltsin, uh, but also uh, Foreign Minister Shevardnadze. <coughs> President Yeltsin uh, proposed at the time what was called the Global uh, Protection System. Uh, he made a major speech at the U UN uh, stating that uh, the international uh, community should develop a system that would include a global network of missile defense capabilities, all clearly inconsistent with the ABM Treaty. And it was Foreign Minister Shevardnadze at the time who announced publicly uh, that the Krasnyarsk radar uh, was a violation of the ABM Treaty. Therefore, explaining the confusion of the Russian delegation at the SCC. Uh, President Bush, Bush 41, uh, endorsed Yeltsin's proposal for the Global Protection System and proposed the U.S. GPALS system, the Global Protection Against Limited Strikes, as the U.S. contribution to that initiative. GPALS was to, uh, was, to, was to consist of, I think it was a thousand small space-based interceptors, brilliant pebbles, uh, as well as five or six land-based uh, uh, ICBM interceptor sites. Again, all fundamentally inconsistent with the, with the uh, limitations of the ABM Treaty. Uh, while uh, the Brilliant Pebbles pro program did become a program of record within DOD, the program was ended uh, in the first days of the Clinton administration. Uh, when uh, Secretary Aspen announced that he was going to take the stars out of Star Wars. Uh, and, you know, even though the Cold War had ended uh, and Russia was now considered at least a potential friend, 
uh, the Clinton administration reestablished the ABM Treaty as a major component of U.S. national security strategy, uh, as did Russia after, after Yeltsin. And for eight years, uh, while I was in comfortable political exile at NDU, uh, at every U.S.-Russian summit, the ABM Treaty was referred to uh, in the joint communiques as the cornerstone of strategic stability. In other words, mutual assured destruction was once again the chief operating principle of the relationship. And all of this would change, of course, with the election of Bush 43. Uh, I had the uh, privilege of serving on the NSC transition team, and Dr. Rice uh, asked me to stay on and lead the counterproliferation effort. Uh, and of course, uh, part of that effort uh, was uh, uh, dealing with uh, the missile threats that we faced, given that missiles were a principal means of delivery for uh, weapons of mass destruction. The essential step in countering the growing missile threat to the U.S. from rogue states was to move beyond the ABM Treaty to withdraw so that the U.S. could protect the American homeland from missile attack. Remember that North Korea had successfully launched a Taipo Dung missile in August of 1998, uh, which according to a unclassified IC assessment at the time, demonstrated the ability to deliver a small payload to intercontinental range. I was assigned the NSC and interagency day-to-day uh, -day lead to get out of the treaty. Uh, the real leaders, of course, were Dr. Rice, the Vice President, and the President, as this was a top-level priority for all of them. And our approach consisted of five steps. The first was to get control of the issue within the U.S. government. Uh, from day one, all talking points were written and approved by the NSC. This was absolutely necessary to break from the past dogma, uh, which was deeply enshrined in our bureaucracy. We kept at the NSC, a multi-page catalog of myths associated with the treaty and provided responses on a daily basis to each of them. Myths such as defenses are destabilizing and defenses will start an arms race. Something that I think we'll refer to and come back to in, in our discussion. The second step was to have the President present the rationale and the roadmap for getting out of the treaty. Uh, and this he did in a speech uh, at NDU uh, on the 1st of May 2001. This was actually his first speech on national security uh, as president. Uh, and if I don't say so myself, it was a great speech. Uh, it uh, went through 27 drafts. The 27th draft was very similar to the first one, actually, but it was a lesson learned in how presidential speech making is done. The speech provided a new strategic framework for dealing with the rogue state threats. It looked forward to better and more normal relations with Russia, a, re a relationship in which the threat of mutual nuclear annihilation was no longer central. And it called for a new concept of deterrence in which defenses would play an important role. An important role. The concept would be contained uh, in presidential guidance, NSPD-4, uh, which was provided to the interagency on a classified basis. The third step was to consult with allies and all interested parties, most importantly with Russia. And I must say that uh, in those months that led to the uh, end of the ABM Treaty, Moscow did not put forth any significant resistance, uh, perhaps, I believe, because they knew the new president was determined to withdraw in order to protect uh, the, U the, the United States from emerging threats. In fact, I'll never forget uh, a uh, meeting in the Kremlin in October of 2001 between President Putin and uh, Secretary Rumsfeld. I was the NSC rep because we were going to give Russia advance notice of our intention uh, to uh, withdraw and the president's announcement uh, to that effect. Uh, Putin and Sergei Ivanov, who was the defense minister at the time, uh, showed very little interest uh, and instead uh, talked about Soviet lessons learned from their invasion of in Afghanistan. Uh, this was just at the time that we were about to use force against the Taliban. That was much more uh, of a topic and much more of interest to the, uh, to the Russian leaders than the ABM Treaty. And when we did withdraw from the treaty, I think you all need to underline this, Putin's response was very instructive. Uh, while he said that the withdrawal was a mistake, he emphasized that it was not a threat to Russia. It was not a threat to Russia that the U.S. was going to deploy defenses. And he announced at the same time major reductions in Russian offensive nuclear forces 
totally contrary to the myth that the deployment of strategic defenses will lead to an arms race. The fourth step was to overcome bureaucratic resistance to withdrawal coming from the highest levels at the State Department, make that all levels of the State Department, uh, and we can certainly talk about that. And the fifth step, uh, also to overcome bureaucratic resistance, but this time from the Department of Defense, was to provide the Defense Department with explicit presidential guidance that it will deploy by the fall of 2004 a capability to defend the U.S. homeland against limited strikes. When the U.S. did withdraw, the sky did not fall. In fact, the treaty went away with a whimper, not even a small bang. And today, while missile defenses remain controversial, no one, no serious individual, at least on this side of the Atlantic, uh, no one that I'm aware of, uh, is arguing that we should return to the days when we were prohibited by treaty from defending the American people and our territory from missile attack. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Biliana. Thank you, Tom. Good afternoon, everyone. I am delighted to be a member of this panel today. I would like to thank CSIS, the Project on Military and Diplomatic History, and the Missile Defense Project for hosting us. In my remarks today, I would like to focus on two things. First, I will briefly discuss why the ABM Treaty was important to the Soviet Union and later on to Russia. And second, I will talk about how Russia reacted to the U.S. withdrawal of the ABM Treaty and to the subsequent deployment of U.S. and NATO missile defenses in Europe and um, in Asia. To Moscow, the ABM Treaty was significant for two reasons. One was strategic and one was political. Strategically, the ABM Treaty was important because it was integral to the nuclear deterrence architecture that existed between Washington and the Kremlin. And as Ambassador Joseph also mentioned, Moscow's leaders often referred to the treaty as the cornerstone of strategic stability because it limited the number of missile defense systems that each country could deploy. And in this way, um, each country remained vulnerable to one another's nuclear attacks. The treaty under those circumstances preserved nuclear deterrence because in the event of a crisis, neither, uh, ne neither state would dare to attack the other out of fear of devastating retaliation. To Moscow, the ABM Treaty also had political significance. The treaty created a legally binding framework that both Moscow and Washington had to respect. And in this way, it created a structure of parity in which Moscow was placed on equal footing with Washington. That equality was central to Russia's ability to claim a great power status, especially in the 1990s when the country experienced economic crises and a significant deterioration of its conventional military capabilities. Especially in that period, Russia couldn't claim parity with the United States on the basis of its GDP or conventional forces, and that's why Russia became overly reliant on its vast nuclear arsenal and on the nuclear deterrence architecture that existed between Russia and the United States. And the ABM Treaty was a part of that architecture. That is why, considering the strategic and political significance of the treaty to Moscow, it's not surprising that when the United States decided to withdraw from the treaty, Moscow objected. And Ambassador Joseph also very well outlined Moscow's muted opposition at that time, so I'm not going to repeat the same facts. Um, Russia has also consistently opposed um, the subsequent U.S. deployment, development, and deployment of missile defense in Europe and in Asia. And the Kremlin objects to these deployments largely based on the premise that the missile defense systems are at least partially built against Russia and that they will undermine Russia's strategic deterrence and also global stability. Moscow argues that by improving its uh, BMD capabilities, the United States will increase its protection against a nuclear second strike from Russia. And it's important to highlight this here. Russia isn't worried that missile defense is going to threaten its first strike capability, but it's specifically worried that it is going to threaten its second strike capability. According to Moscow's logic, the United States will grow confident that it could attack Russia first using nuclear weapons. It will severely damage Russia's nuclear arsenal and then use missile defense to intercept the few remaining um, missiles that Russia is going to launch in response. Regarding BMD in Europe, Russia's BMD objections relate not only to the current plan of GPAA, but also to the future likelihood of improvement and development of the missile defense system, um, which NATO has left open-ended. 
Russia is specifically worried that um, the radars that are used as a part of the system will be improved, uh, that more interceptors are going to be placed on bases closer to Russia's borders. Before 2008, Russia's um, military leadership has expressed concern that components of the missile defense system could even be deployed in bases, um, on bases in Georgia and Ukraine. Russia was, has also expressed the concern that NATO is going to use missile defense as a pretext to position military, to increase its military presence in the region closer to Russia. Russia also feared that some of the platforms that are deployed as a part of the BMD system in Europe can be used to launch ground-based cruise missiles. And when Russia voices this concern, it specifically refers to the MK-41 vertical launch systems that are currently deployed in Devesel, Romania. Russia uses also the same argument to claim that the United States is violating the INF Treaty, and we can talk at length why this is not the case, of course. Since 2012, Moscow has also more clearly voiced its concern over the relationship between NATO's missile defense in Europe and the U.S. Um, global missile defense policy. And in this context, Moscow heavily criticizes U.S. cooperation on missile defense with Japan and South Korea and claims that the United States is using North Korea as a pretext for deploying more advanced weapons and missile defense systems in Asia. And Moscow argues that the objective of those deployments are again to offset Russia's military capabilities and those of China as well. So those are only some of Russia's security-based concerns. And as we examine the policies and the technical parameters of the BMD systems, as well as Russia's offensive military capabilities, it becomes clear that missile defense doesn't present a threat to Russia's nuclear deterrent. As currently planned, GPAA doesn't have any capacity to engage Russia's ICBMs. Russia has more than, four, uh, more than 1,500 warheads, which together with all the other um, various retaliatory measures that Russia can employ guarantee Russia's deterrence. And it seems that Russia, Russia's fears at this stage are primarily based on unarticulated future developments and on distorted threat perceptions. <coughs> Yet, it is also important to note that to some of Russia's leaders, those, uh, the arguments that I just outlined seem pretty legitimate. Nevertheless, um, I would also like to note that the issue of BMD is also politically expedient to the Kremlin. And the, the Russian government has often referred to missile defense as evidence of U.S. and NATO aggression and has used it to domestically um, justify increase in military spending and focus on military modernization. In closing, it is also worth noting that despite criticizing the U.S. Um, missile defense developments, Russia is developing its own missile defense system. It recently tested interceptors to improve uh, its missile defense system around Moscow, the A-35. And if we have to compare interceptors, as it currently stands, Russia has more interceptors than its, the U.S. equivalent. Russia has um, at least 68 interceptors in its BMD system around Moscow, while even with the U.S. plan for 44 homeland defense interceptors, Russia would still have about 24 more. Certainly, when we look at those numbers, we have to also consider the general correlation of forces, and we have to consider this within the context of Russia's and U.S. nuclear offensive and defensive capability and the specific scenarios in which these BMD systems will be employed. But still, um, those numbers present a um, helpful stepping stone for further analysis. Thank you. All right. Well, if, if, if you are up for it, I thought I'd throw a couple questions and then uh, open it up for, for broader discussion. You know, James, I, I think... I wonder if you might uh, take this question a little bit with an eye to what the lessons of history can teach us uh, for today. Uh, you made a comment along the way that the, the Trump administration is very anti-arms control. Mm -hmm. And I, I was immediately thought of the, the new nuclear posture review, uh, which has the following statement that progress in arms control is not an end in and of itself and depends on the security environment and the participation of willing partners. Uh, and then goes on to list, among other things, Russian noncompliance with about five different treaties. Um, I wonder, therefore, if you might speak a little bit to the, the confidence with which the United States, when entering into SALT-1 and, and ABM, had with respect to Soviet compliance, uh, and whether, in the absence of that confidence, it, that might guide us on how to be either for or against arms control. Giant. Thank you very much. You know, I thought that might um, provoke a little, uh, some kind of reaction. But I, I am, so I think what's important is the different historical context. So we're talking about INF, 
which is uh, sort of concluded at almost the height of mutual confidence. And then you, so with SALT two, with SALT one in particular, um, you're really at the, the verification um, that's required for SALT one um, is much, much, uh, is much, much lower, right? The threshold for confidence is much, much lower. Um, so the Americans could be more confident because they were using unilateral means um, to uh, verify um, those, that particular, uh, the SALT one agreements. And even with that, there was a great deal um, of suspicion. Um, I don't think, so I don't think there was necessarily greater confidence, particularly on the part of Nixon, who again, in his conversations, is incredibly um, uh, uh, anti, uh, he still has that anti-communist uh, part of his personality from the 50s, um, which, is, which comes out, and occasionally the Soviets realize that it's coming out, and they say, oh, we have to, we have to kind of tamp, try and tamp it down and get him back onto detente because the, the anti-communist is coming out. So I don't think it was a necessarily um, greater confidence, but obviously as the process advanced, in particular, um, you know, in the, with the height of uh, good relations, relatively good relations in the, in the 80s between Reagan and Gorbachev, um, uh, that you know the confidence was much higher, and so a much more sophisticated agreement could be uh, concluded. And you raise a very good point, which is, in, given a lack of that, how how do you go uh, forward? Um, I think there's you know there's two parts of that. One is that I think, despite the um, comments about uh, arms control in the nuclear posture review, um, it is clear that you know compared to the Obama. Um, uh, the Obama uh, 2010 nuclear post review, review, there is a lot, uh, you know, arms control has been uh, downgraded. That is in part, I think, due to um, the changing strategic environment, but I think there is also a, a greater skepticism, perhaps warranted. Um, so that's how I would, I would go with that. Either of you want to comment on that? I'll throw a question to you, Ambassador Joseph. Um, I wonder, you know, you were talking about why didn't Reagan withdraw, why didn't Bush, George H.W. Bush withdraw. Uh, I wonder if you might speak to whether there was any consideration uh, in the uh, Bush, George W. Bush, 43 administration, uh, to amend the treaty, to allow it to do the things we wanted to do in terms of, as you said, limited ballistic missile attacks. Um, was there an effort uh, to amend particular articles, for instance, uh, that would allow you to do that? Yeah, let me, uh, let, let, let me come back to that. Let me just say a couple words about the Russians and my experience with the Russians. The Russians are realists. Okay, I mentioned this meeting in the Kremlin in October of 2001. I, I, I had come there to talk about the ABM Treaty and to give them notice. They, they knew it, it was coming. Uh, there wasn't much of an issue associated that, with that, but what did Sergei Ivanov do? He said, why don't we get out of the INF Treaty, okay? I mean, they're thinking about Russian interests, and that's understandable, and that's okay, it seems to me. I had a, maybe I can, maybe I shouldn't admit this, but I had a long working relationship with Sergei Kislyak when he was the, before he was uh, ambassador here. He was the uh, deputy foreign minister, and he was the head of the Soviet, the Russian delegation, and I, the U.S. delegation, to the strategic dialogue for a couple of years. And we would go through this dance every time he had read his talking points on missile defense, their destabilizing. Now, this is, this is 2005, 2006, 2007. Uh, much different state of relationship with Russia than it was in 2001. And he'd go through this, this dance about with uh, the usual talking points. Defenses are destabilizing. How do we know uh, that... Uh, you know, this won't affect the strategic uh, offensive capability of Russian forces. I think you've, you've clearly answered that one. Uh, he also suggested that uh, the U.S. could sneak in offensive missiles into these 10 silos. This was the, this was the original third site concept. Uh, and we'd get over that within the first five minutes, and then we'd go to, we'd go to the real business. Uh, we'd talk about those areas, those important issues in the non-proliferation, 
arms control and other areas in which we shared our objectives. We, we inter our interest intersected, and that's how we made progress. That's how we worked the global initiative to combat nuclear terrorism. That's how we worked an initiative on nuclear energy, making it more proliferation resistant so we don't have more Irans. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't this kabuki dance over, uh, over, uh, over defenses. Uh, we put that behind us and, and, and we worked, uh, we worked uh, a, a much more positive agenda. Uh, in terms of the Obama administration, yes, they were very pro-arms control to the point that they were pro-unilateral disarmament, okay? That was an ideological commitment. That commitment I don't detect in the Trump administration. But I think when Secretary Mattis says that he, we're serious about arms control mm -hmm. before Congress and testifying on, on Friday, I think you have to take him seriously. He's a serious man, and he's not, going to, he's not going to put forth something that he doesn't believe. But it's a different type of arms control. It would be an arms control that would be in the U.S. interest. It would be an arm, arms control agreement that actually led to real reductions that actually provided for effective uh, 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 verification. Uh, if the Russians are interested in that, I think the door's gonna be wide open. Uh, if they're interested in getting another New START treaty where they get to go up and we have to go down and you don't have effective verification, well, I don't think they're gonna be met with, uh, with an open door on that. Uh, as for amending the APM treaty, uh, I mentioned the fourth step uh, of this five-step process was to uh, deal with uh, efforts by the State Department really at the highest level uh, to do exactly as you say, Tom, to uh, put forth proposals that why don't, you know, we could stay within the ABM Treaty, we'll just tell the Russians, we'll just tell the Russians what we want to do. When you think about it, this really is rocket science, okay, that we're talking about. And you know we're we're not able to lay forth lay down a you know a program of development uh, and testing uh, ahead of time. We're going to have to learn from what we do, make adjustments. And it was totally it was totally uh, uh, impractical to move in that direction. Uh, in fact, uh, there is a little known story. I keep giving these war stories. It's a reflection of my age, I think. Uh, it was at the. Uh, it was in the end game, uh, and the uh, Russians said, "You know, is there a way you can do exactly what your Secretary of State is suggesting?" Uh, and so a number of us, a small number, a very small and select number of us, uh, briefed the Russian Defense Chief of Staff, uh, uh, Chief of uh, uh, Chief of uh, the Defense General Staff. Uh, and we walked through a briefing and we said, here's something we're going to do. Here's something we're going to do. Here's something we're going to do. In each case, it would violate the treaty if we were still in the treaty. We are not going to violate the treaty. We are going to exit the treaty so we don't violate the treaty. And his response was, you know, it was, boy, if you do all of those things, you would have to violate the treaty. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, in, 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 in fact, that was, that was the conclusion, and uh, uh, that, that was the reason that we couldn't go down that path. We also had uh, a tasking from my boss uh, to uh, determine wh whether or not we could modify the treaty, not through a sort of revised testing scheme, but just modify the language of the treaty to permit us to do whatever we wanted to do in terms of development and testing. But there again, I mean, if you've read the ABM Treaty, you know it's a very short document. It's not like START. It's, it's, a, it's a very, very short document. And, you know, the first article, it's been a while since I've read it, uh, as in since, 19, since 2002. Uh, but the first article is, you know, you, 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 know, you will not uh, deploy defenses uh, to protect the territory uh, of your nation. I'm paraphrasing. So, yes, you could take out the knot and you could say you are authorized to defend your nation and you could go through each of the, each of the, uh, each of the uh, clauses, the provisions of the treaty, uh, but what's the point? Uh, and it was determined that that, uh, that approach also was, uh, uh, w would not be effective. Uh, 
and the decision was made. We just, we just need to get out. We need to get out because we need to defend the United States against new threats. North Korea is coming on with ballistic missiles, and we need to be in a position where we can defend against them so that we're not blackmailed, so that we don't give in to coercion, uh, and that we have uh, an effective, uh, effective defense. Uh, and uh, we also uh, want to deter uh, other countries from acquiring ballistic missiles. And if we have effective defenses, that may serve as a uh, deterrent or, or a, a means of dissuading them from moving in that direction. So, Brianna, you, I think, made a, a good case of the uh, Russians are, have both military and political uh, aspects of the, of the sort of the typical top, talking points. Uh, I'm, I'm frequently struck by the commonality of talking points shared between, say, Moscow and Beijing. Uh, it seems like a similar playbook, whether you're talking about Poland or, or South Korea, for instance. Um, and yet, uh, I'm also struck by the fact that neither Russia nor China has ever really met the NATO or, Al or, or U.S. Uh, uh, air or missile defense system that they don't hate. You know, if there's four phases of EPAA, they want to get rid of phase four. If there's three, they want to get rid of phase three. Um, if there's a Patriot launcher in Poland that doesn't even have any missiles on it, even that's offensive. Um, and so I guess I, I, would, I would raise the question on the political side, because I, I, I find it mostly laughable that, that standard missiles and in Romania are going to chase Russian ICBMs from a technical side. On the political side, is there a reason to see this Russian or Chinese objections as sincere, but also as a kind of information operation to uh, affect U.S. or allied domestic publics and drive wedges between our, the United States and its allies? Um, one aspect in which Russia uses that debate politically is for its domestic audiences. Um, for example, Russia often refers to missile defense in Europe as, as proof of U.S. and NATO aggression, as a as, as demonstration that those countries are bent on Russia's destruction. And when uh, Russia uses that narrative, it fuels in, it into the popular perception that Russia is a besieged power surrounded by enemies and that Russia has to defend itself from those enemies. Um, and um, I would very much imagine that that same debate is used in Russia propaganda channels uh, such as RT and Sputnik. Um, and is, that message is probably spread through ethnic Russians, Russian speakers, specifically in the Baltics and other, in other countries um, where Russian-speaking populations watch those channels. Specifically in Russia, what struck me as very interesting is that um, the Kremlin often uses BMD as a justification to increase military spending, and it's often used BMD specifically to justify the deployment and development, for example, of DSLBM Bulava, also known as the SSN-31. And um, also, uh, in last December, they tested an ICBM, the Pol M, also known as SS-27, and they said that they were specifically testing the missile's capabilities to overcome ballistic missile defenses. Mm -hmm. So for them, it's a domestically, politically expedient topic, but I would imagine it also has an international component. I, I've got a bunch of other questions, but I think I'd rather open it up to, to the floor. Um, and so if folks want to raise their hand, we've got some mics we can bring around. Uh, introduce yourself, uh, keep it concise and in the form of a question, and we'll let uh, folks uh, from the panel answer it. Who wants to go? Peter, up front. Hi, I'm Peter Husey from the Air Force Association. I had an interesting discussion with Jim Miller recently, and this is the issue. Between the Moscow Treaty and New START, the Russians agreed to reducing nuclear weapons by almost two-thirds in the strategic realm at the time at which the ABM Treaty was gone. And I, my question to Jim at the time was, how can you then say that the presence of, or the absence of the ABM Treaty is going to harm arms control? Who wants to take, anybody? Go for it. Sure. Well, the Treaty of Moscow 
I just, yeah, thank you. The Treaty of Moscow uh, codified uh, what both sides had intended to do, absent a treaty. Uh, the U.S. Uh, President uh, Bush had announced that we were going down, down significantly. Uh, President Putin had done the same. Uh, the Bush administration did not think it was necessary to put these numbers into a treaty, uh, but uh, the Russians have this, and it's understandable, this uh, desire, and it's consistent across many decades, uh, to codify uh, in a treaty uh, the, uh, the force levels uh, because they are concerned, uh, this is how they express it, they're concerned about you know, one administration supporting or, or uh, departing from the previous administration in terms of their uh, strategic, uh, strategic uh, uh, initiatives. Uh, and they want to make sure that there's some consistency over time. Uh, President Bush uh, resisted putting it in the treaty, but President Putin kept asking, and this was, again, this was a different relationship. In 2001, we had a much different relationship. Uh, and so President Bush said, okay, well, you know, we'll, we'll do a treaty, and so John Bolton gets on an airplane and you know, spends a couple days in Moscow and comes back with a three-page treaty. Uh, the New START treaty, uh, which claims to reduce by one-third the number of uh, strategic weapons or strategic warheads uh, is uh, only uh, is is only you know uh, I, I don't know how best to characterize it. Uh, it's you know a shell game. Uh, maybe maybe that works best. Uh, you change the counting rules, uh, and so under New Start, uh, we have to go down from the level that's established, and we do go down about a third. <laughs> But the Russians get to go up because they're starting from a lower level. That's understandable. But the other part of it is you change the counting rule. So you no longer count each weapon that's in a bomber individually. You just count a bomber as one no matter what they, what they hold. So for the first time, for the first time, you have a situation in which a treaty, New START, actually allows the, you know, the party to go higher than the previous treaty. Okay? But... Nevertheless, it was a treaty, and you know it did restrict the United States. Uh, it it had, I think, you know, very little to do with defenses and the state of defenses or the desire to deploy defenses. But let me say that you know uh, the Bush administration was not willing to sacrifice sort of our ability to deploy defenses for the sake of arms control. Whereas the Obama administration clearly was, okay? I mean, there's this famous off-mic experience in Seoul that I think you're familiar with, Peter, uh, in which President Obama talks about to, to Medvedev about the ability to be more flexible on, on missile defense after the election. Uh, you find the cancellation of the third site. You find the cancellation of the fourth phase of the you know, phased adaptive approach, which was the, which was the only phase that would have contributed to the defense of the United States, okay, uh, by being able to have some capability against rudimentary ICBMs, not Russian ICBMs, but ICBMs in the future coming from, coming from Iran. But that was given, that, those things were, were given up uh, for the sake of getting, uh, getting negotiations going beyond New START. Uh, clearly the priority was reductions uh, and disarmament. Uh, as opposed to missile defense, and missile defense became a, became a bargaining chip. That, I think, has changed in this administration, too. Right here in the middle. Right here. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Bailey O'Donnell. I'm a student at American University, and my question is, due to the current presidential uh, administration, could there be a complete reduction of IBMs and increased alliance, or do you think there could be another situation that revolts? Could you say that again, a, a reduction of what? A reduction of IBMs. ICBMs. ICBMs, thank you. <laughs> Almost there. Anybody wants, well, the, the, uh, the NPR just released d doesn't seem to suggest that, uh, at least. Um, uh, as with the Obama administration, they reaffirmed the importance of the triad. Uh, so, I, I, actually, I would read the additional sentence from the NPR that uh, I did not uh, continue with. 
the U.S. will work con to convince states in violation of their arms control obligations to return to compliance. The United States remains willing to engage in a prudent arms control agenda, but then elaborates that it has to be in U.S. Uh, interest, as, as Ambassador Joseph was, was emphasizing uh, uh, previously. So I think it probably depends, especially on what Russia does. That's the gigantic uh, theme of the new NPR is going to depend on what they do uh, as well. Who else? The gentleman right here in the middle. To, to your right, sir. Over here, thank you. Uh, Alan Carpian, I'm a retired Navy reservist. We, um, and when I was at the uh, Navy Command Center Reserve Unit at the Pentagon, we just missed talking to Lieutenant General Graham, who apparently was uh, briefing President Reagan when he was supposed to talk to us, and so he sent a substitute. Um, what does all this have to do, or, or are there lessons learned with Iran, North Korea, and, and what's going on in Israel? I mean, how, does, this, does that relate, or am I, am I going away from the strategic uh, issues? So thank you very much for your question. Um, that's a, a really interesting comment. I, I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head, which is that um, for more limited threats, um, this is where um, people see uh, missile defense as holding the most value. And I would say just on a, as a historical and the lessons of history, um, there is a strange echo in history uh, in the 1960s, which is when McNamara, Robert McNamara, Secretary of Defense under Kennedy and Johnson, um, deployed, uh, announced the deployment of a anti-ballistic missile system for the United States in September of 1967. And McNamara's um, justification for that system was not um, against the Soviets, it was against um, China. Um, and China at that time um, was, uh, was the, if you like, the North Korea of the 1960s. It was seen, perceived in very much the same way as North Korea is today. Um, very closed society, uh, hugely, uh, hugely violent and repressive towards its own people and potentially undeterrable uh, through, um, a re through retaliatory means. Um, and that, that sort of bit of that historical uh, data sort of does suggest to me that that is where missile defense lies, um, is you know, the justification, the most, um, if you like, the most cogent justification for it has always been, um, as, as, as you say, as a, as a, at the substrate, you know, at a smaller actor, um, potentially um, interpreted as undeterrable through other means. And for me, that seems to be the most cogent argument uh, it was in the 1960s and it is today. Anybody else? Uh, right in the back and, and then up here, yeah. Hi, my question from State Department. I had the pleasure of working on some of these issues at the and, same time as. And your name, sir? Mike Lexon. Okay. Same time Ambassador Joseph was, and I remember nothing but harmony between those two. <laughs> whatever, whatever agency you were with and state, we always got along well. Uh, historical questions, the two of them, which Bob may know from personal experience and the researchers may have learned about. At any point in discussions with the Soviets or the Russians, did they offer their version of a zero option in which they would take down the Moscow ABMs and say, we'll do that, which they never actually have done, of course. We'll do that if you do this on our behalf. The other is whether anybody has any further information about the thinking behind the Krasnoyarsk radar, which somebody in Moscow must have known would be a violation. And if they were trying to keep us in the ABM treaty, you would think that that would probably be something they wouldn't want to be all that blatant about. Thanks. Um. I wasn't going to respond to this question, but I wanted to respond to the question about the further reduction of ICBMs, if I may. I um, had the opportunity a few years ago to uh, speak to a general who was who participated in the um, drafting of the new start, and I asked him, how much um, more would Russia be willing to reduce the number of its warheads? And he looked at me and he said, Biljana will be willing to reduce them to 1,550. And this is the exact number in the new start. So the answer that he gave me is that probably we will not be willing to reduce them further. Sure. Mike, it's good to see you again. It has been, it has been a while, uh, but always harmonious, always. 
Uh, and so I'll try to keep it that way. <laughs> uh, I'm aware of no uh, uh, initiative on the part of the Russians or even a request on the part of the U.S. to go to, uh, to eliminate the, the Moscow ABM system. Uh, and in fact, the uh, original uh, uh, ABM treaty uh, permitting two sites was uh, sort of negotiated in a way that would permit Moscow to be protected. Uh, and we, when we went to one site after the amendment of the ABM treaty, it permitted Moscow and it extended into well into a missile field. Uh, so uh, not, aware, not aware of that. In terms of Krasnyarsky, you know, I, I never really understood what the, you know, what the internal sort of dynamic was in, on the part of the Soviet Union. Clearly, you had this huge LPAR radar. I'm like, you remember, I mean, it's a huge LPAR radar. You know, there's, uh, under the treaty, they're supposed to be on the periphery, orient out, outwards. Here, it's right in the middle of the country uh, with the wrong orientation. Uh, and the only lame knuckle-headed ex excuse that the Russians could provide was this was for space tracking, okay? I mean, it was, it was just a, it was a, it was a silly position, which they maintained for many years, which is also, I think, instructive. Uh, but, you know, when, uh, you know, w when the relationship started to change, as we saw the end of the, so uh, the Soviet Union coming, I think they became much more willing. I mean, uh, Shevardnadze declares it to be a, uh, a violation, and I think ultimately they, they changed it into a furniture, it's, it's a, you know, a furniture factory or something, you know, I mean, it's, uh, so, so, so they did move away from it. But it was, it was a large investment. Uh, and it was a, an in-your-face, an in-your-face violation. Let me just uh, say a couple words about uh, Russia, too, uh, and Russia's interest in uh, more arms control. Uh, I don't think they have any interest at all. I mean, yes, they would engage in negotiations if they thought they could get another uh, uh, treaty that, uh, that, you know, that gave them what they want and, 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 and constrained us, okay? Why, why wouldn't they? Uh, but they're, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that their position today is pretty much we're, we're not interested. At least that's where their actions take us. Uh, I, I remember at a, at a lunch with, uh, with Sergei Kislyak, just you know, the two of us, and I said, Sergei, is there any way, because this was after New START ratification and the, you know, the, the, the Senate had sort of asked that in any further negotiations with Russia, we emphasize uh, theater nuclear systems to get at the eight or ten to one disparity that exists currently, and you know, Sergey just looked at me and said, "You know, why would we? Why would I, I mean, they've they've got thousands and we've got hundreds. I mean, where's where's the deal here? We gave up our thousands. Okay, we unilaterally, and this wasn't under Obama. This was under President uh, Bush 41 through the Presidential Nuclear Initiatives. We gave up our our our, our theater systems, or 85, 90 percent of our theater systems." Uh, and on North Korea, uh, look, North Korea is, de is deploying uh, ICBM class missiles uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, I, I think the two most important are to hold our cities hostage so that they can uh, deter us from coming into the uh, theater in the, uh, uh, in the defense of, uh, of South Korea if there is a war whether it's a deliberately planned war, whether it's a war that happens out of miscalculation and miscommunication, if they can hold our cities hostage, they may be able to win. If we come in, if the, if the fight is conventional, they lose, they know that. That's also why they're emphasizing chemical and, bio and biological weapons. And I think the, the other principal reason, uh, and this is, this is, I know, a convenient talking point for them, but I think they actually believe it as well, and that is, uh, they're concerned about what they call the Libya experience, uh, where uh, Colonel Gaddafi gave up his nuclear program, uh, and I would argue, I, I would note, a number of years later, uh, from 2003 when he gave them up to 2011, uh, 11 when they, NATO intervened, but NATO intervened, he's overthrown, he's killed, and they don't want to be in that same situation. And so I think it's a protection against outside interference or intervention on the behalf of the people of North Korea who are the first and foremost victims of that brutal totalitarian regime. So first of all, I think if that's true about the furniture factory, the CSIS missile defense project needs a coffee table 
from the Krasnoyarsk <laughs> furniture. I'm just saying that right now. It is true. <laughs> we, need, we need a coffee table. Second, um, you, this, this may be for Biliana and Ambassador Joseph, but James, per perhaps also for you. I mean, notwithstanding the fact that, uh, you know, the North Korea thing is about protection in the event of, of deterrence failure, among other things, um, so much of this conversation, since before the ABM Treaty and, and to the present day, so much of the missile defense conversation is justifiably within the larger deterrence calculus. And so going to the ABM Treaty, it, it didn't, it prohibited or it allowed two in the later one site. Um, and one of that was for the National uh, Capital Region and an ICBM site. And the idea was you could limit the numbers, but it would contribute to deterrence. So here's my question for you. And that was Safeguard and, and Grand Forks, and, and that was the idea there. So the question is today, put aside the ICBMs per se, although Reagan's SDI speech, the vast majority of it was about ICBM survivability. Is there an element in which that contribution to deterrence through active defenses in some way, uh, whether it's air defenses or missile defenses for our military assets, is there a way in which that conversation needs to be re-energized vis-a-vis Russia, vis-a-vis -vis China, you know, this sort of theater issues? How can missile defenses contribute to deterrence with respect to the great power competition today? So, um, several points, that's an excellent question. Uh, Russia now refers more to missile defense as the weapon of the aggressor and is destabilizing and it's very hard to put missile defense back into a framework of deterrence. But I know for our years before April 2014, NATO was actively trying for the NATO-Russia Council and the Missile Defense Working Group was actively trying to engage Russia in some sort of missile defense um, architecture that will be mutually acceptable for NATO member states as well as for Russia. Um, but Russia often um, asked for more than NATO was willing to provide. Russia asked for legally binding guarantees that the missile defense is not going to be targeted at Russia at any point in the future. NATO members decided to prioritize the adaptability of the system because the threat was changing and they wanted to ensure that they can also change missile defense if necessary. Russia also asked for joint command and control, uh, which NATO countries were not willing to entertain. Um, in my recent discussion, um, comment has come up from the Russians that they may be willing to consider a different treaty that would focus, not a modification of the ABM Treaty, but a different treaty that would focus on um, three components. Uh, one of them will be limiting the number of interceptors that the United States and NATO can deploy. The second component would be limiting the geographical locations where there, those interceptors could be deployed. And the third is limiting the speed of those interceptors to five kilometers uh, per second. Um, so given the current state of U.S.-Russian relations, I don't see this as a realistic proposal to debate anything at all, but maybe at some point in the future this could be considered. Still, given the need to keep the framework adaptable, I also don't see that how that is realistic. Ambassador Joseph, maybe you have anything else to add? Uh, sorry, I just, yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree. I think, and in terms of keeping the dialogue going, obviously things are very, very difficult uh, now, but keeping track to alive, to me, seems like, you know, a good way of, of at least keeping that dialogue going, not committing to anything, uh, but on a non-official basis, working out concepts and trying to work through um, this point, which is that, you know, we're not in the Cold War anymore. The United States in particular has moved um, in its thinking on these issues far beyond uh, the sort of dominant framework um, of the Cold War, and therefore um, one needs to be incredibly creative and had some really smart people talking about it, and I think track two would be a great way of doing that. I'll try to answer your question on... Uh contribution of missile defense to, to deterrence. Uh, there is a missile defense review being undertaken by the administration. I don't know what's in it, and uh, we'll, we'll all have to wait and see. Uh, but, you know, there are, uh, there are a number of ways. Uh, you in, indicate some of them in which defenses, strategic defenses, uh, defenses against ICBMs or SLBMs, 
uh, can, uh, can contribute to deterrence. And let's not forget there's also sort of accidental launches, there's also unauthorized launches, and in the past, uh, the Democrat uh, uh, initiatives in the United States have, have focused on missile defenses against unauthorized and, uh, and ac accidental launch, and those are, uh, you know, legitimate, legitimate concerns. But in terms of contributing to, to deterrence, well, first there's, you know, what's called the preferential defense, okay, which is defending an uh, uh, ICBM field, for example. Uh, and we did have uh, the uh, system that uh, Susan Cook and I uh, visited at one point uh, in, uh, in Langdon, North Dakota. Uh, and uh, the idea was that, you know, if, uh, if there was a first strike, uh, the missile defense could contribute to, you know, to, to maintaining a second strike capability by defending those missiles in the field that, uh, that was uh, defended. There's also, as I mentioned, uh, and this was in the phase one requirements for SDI, this notion of increasing the uncertainty of the war planners or forcing the other side to a larger uh, uh, strike, which they very well may not want to entail because of the escalatory dynamics that are involved. Uh, we are currently, and you saw this in the NPR, very concerned about Russian doctrine, very, uh, offensive doctrine, the nuclear doctrine, uh, in which they're thinking about small-scale use, in some cases small-scale low-yield use, but also small-scale use even at the strategic level. Okay, and their doctrine talks about it, their, uh, their, uh, their uh, exercises uh, re reflect this thinking, and we haven't responded to that. Perhaps missile defense, uh, missile defense is, is a way to do that. Uh, as for uh, you know, dialogue with the Russians, I'm all for it. I certainly agree with, uh, with, with, the, two, with the two other panelists. Uh, but keep in mind, I mean, the Russians are realists, and we often aren't. Uh, and the Russians are cynics, and we almost never are. And so you're up against, you're up against a side that looks at the world differently. As long as you understand that, as long as you work within that uh, context, I think uh, I'm, I, I'm all for dialogue. Uh, but it has to be a dialogue that produces real, real results that are in our national security interest. I think right here, maybe we'll take our last question. And I'm going to answer my question while we're waiting on the mic here. And that is, I think we need to change the, the vocabulary here. I think actually the word missile, the phrase missile defense is, has so much baggage. And when we talk about Russian active defenses, we call it A2AD bubbles, or we call it IADs, integrated air defense systems. But with us, it's, it's all missile defense. And it has so much baggage that there is a, a, uh, an asymmetry of how we talk about it. Perhaps changing the vocabulary to be a little bit more common might, might help with that. Right here. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name's Sarem. I'm with the Missile Defense Advocacy Alliance, uh, so it's great to hear you guys talking about missile defense. Um, I originally had the question that you just brought up about using missile defense as a deterrent, so I'll ask another question now. Um, the ambassador mentioned uh, the Russian doctrine that you know was stressed in the 2018 NPR and that uh, General or Secretary Mattis talked about in the hearing uh, with the House Armed Services Committee yesterday about how Russia thinks uh, ha has this view where they can escalate to victory and then uh, de-escalate a nuclear situation. So. My question is kind of, how do you think the United States should respond? Should we try to increase our missile defense, or should we do you know, what the NPR says and try to develop those low-yield nuclear weapons so that we're not, uh, I mean, the way Mattis put it in the hearing yesterday was that if Russia uses a no, low-yield nuclear weapon, we would either have to you know, give in to that, or we would have to fire back with you know, strategic nuclear weapons, which are part of the triad, which would obviously be uh, escalate the situation even more. So just your view on that. Um, I, can, I, can, I can have a go, um, although uh, as the historian, perhaps not the uh, most, uh, most uh, able to. Um, but I will, I think, I think on the two, uh, the two new options, right, the low yield SLBM and the submarine launched uh, cruise missile, a new version of that, I think one of the things uh, that you mentioned uh, is one, and one of those, one of the justifications shows some of the conceptual weakness of the low yield SLBM concept because it mixes two things, right? It mixes a low yield warhead uh, on a strategic 
system. So the question I would have um, to uh, the authors of the review uh, would be how, if you're sitting in Moscow and you see an SLBM uh, on your radar screen, do you know uh, that that uh, is, oh, we've only, we just detonated a tactical nuclear weapon and we've got this SLBM incoming. Are we just going, what, how do they know that that is a low yield um, warhead on the end uh, of that SLBM? Um, so on, 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 that, on that particular part of the response, um, I, would, I would have some grave uh, difficulties. On the Slickham, well, the Slickham is, uh, I think, there's a, there's a problem with the Allies. Um, the, the whole point of the extended de deterrence is to um, ensure that uh, the Allies have confidence, and yet the concept of the Slickham is predicated on the idea uh, that we should be able to use these weapons without consultation with the Allies. And, just, and again, I see um, a sort of logical uh, flaw there. Um, I don't think um, the, sort of the, the idea that you, could, you have um, two options, really, um, between yielding and, uh, and, 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 and going for a full first strike or some kind of strategic use is actually true. I mean, you have 200 um, uh, gravity bombs in, in Europe. Uh, you have um, the Alcom currently, and you'll have the LRSO uh, in the future. And so um, I, I, don't, I don't, in some ways, I don't really agree with the premise of the, of, of, of the, of the statement in the NPR regarding, or the statement uh, made regarding the sort of surrender or go all out. I don't think that really reflects the reality of the situation. Uh, actually, Bianca, go ahead. Just one comment. Uh, thank you, James, for starting this. I agree with you, and I think that the whole concept of escalate to de-escalate, we don't necessarily have to respond we don't necessarily have to let it go to that stage. I think we have to demonstrate resolve and build smarter returns in Europe to ensure that Russia doesn't get to that stage when they use a low yield weapon. And I think the way to do that, maybe to um, improve tactical missiles, our capabilities in Europe, but it may be also to just demonstrate resolve, which also is a political, um, stronger political posture from NATO and from the United States versus um, improving um, capabilities. Well, I really wasn't going to say anything, but I do have a bit of a different view on this. Uh, we do have dual capable aircraft. We've got them on a small number of bases in NATO Europe. Uh, the unclassified generation time for those uh, aircraft to me means they're not going to be there in a situation uh, in which Russia is pursuing strategic objectives against NATO, against the NATO alliance. Uh, we need to have, again, this is for deterrence. This is not, not about lowering the threshold. This is about raising the threshold for Russian use of low yield weapons, a small number, which they talk about in their doctrine, which they exercise. This is real world. And we need to raise the threshold. We need to strengthen deterrence. And in order to strengthen deterrence, you need to have a survivable option, not an option in which they're residing at vulnerable bases. Remember, uh, Franklin Roosevelt sent all of our uh, capital ships, uh, all of our battleships to Hawaii. Why? Well, in part, it was to deter the Japanese. We were going to deter them. <laughs> well, how'd that work for us? It gave, them, it gave them a target-rich opportunity, which they took full advantage of. It, it undercut deterrence. We need to have a survivable option. And the best means of getting that, as I look at it, is through it's, uh, improving, is through enhancing the current Trident capability. Okay, it's not a new missile, uh, but it is a low-yield option on Trident. Uh, as for Elkham, as, as for LRSO, those are also strategic systems. Okay, and my sense is that if the Russians do see an, SLB, uh, an, SL, an SLBM coming in, uh, a D5 uh, tr Trident coming in, uh, if they do see it and they see only one, that's, that's not going to be sort of uh, uh, the, you know, the, what, what convinces them to undertake massive retaliation and therefore the end of 
all of us. Uh, I think I, I don't think that's uh, that's th that's likely. In terms of Slickem, uh, well, you know, Slickem does provide a, a very important uh, a capability. Just ask the Japanese because it's in theater, it's visible, uh, and it demonstrates the resolve and demonstrates the commitment uh, of of the United States to our security guarantee. The Japanese are very concerned about that. Uh, and they're concerned about it primarily because of North Korea. I remember uh, traveling to the region right after the first test uh, in October of 2007. And the first test was a really significant event, not much more so than the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth. The first one, the first one, you know, set the region, uh, it, it, it was just, you know, in, 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 in total panic. And uh, we were asked to come over, and con Dr. Rice got in an airplane, asked me to go with her, uh, within days of that. And when we got to, when we got to uh, Tokyo, which was the first stop, uh, a fellow named Abe, he was prime minister at the time, uh, you know, asked, Gandhi to, asked Dr. Rice to go out, reaffirm our security commitment. And she did that. Most interesting, when we got to Beijing, the Chinese thanked us for reassuring our nuclear guarantee to Japan because they get it too. They get the non-proliferation aspect of that. And if we don't have a you know, demonstrated resolve along with real world capabilities, I think the proliferation consequences are going to be uh, significant in, uh, in that area. Well, the, if I'm not mistaken, the government of Japan uh issued a statement uh, this past week thanking the United States for the Nuclear Posture Review, but I look forward to Beijing doing the same. <laughs> we could talk about this all day. I think I'm going to cut off there. Thank you, James. Congratulations on your book, and thank you to the panelists.